England go down by 106 runs in Vizag then, but not before a valiant effort throughout the test. For four innings, they kept the pressure in India. Uh, Bass ball continues to push India in a manner very few teams have managed to in the last decade when it comes to test series in India. Steve Harmison joins us from Visakhapatnam to look back uh, at the proceedings from the second test. Steve, uh, thanks for your time. Good to see you again. And it says something uh, that you started the final day of this test with a target of 400 and the Indian camp saying that this game was 70-30, considering no visiting team has ever even scored 300 in the fourth innings of a test here. Uh, so that tells you the impact of baseball already. Uh, but having said that, how do you summarize England's batting performance on the final day of this game? I thought it was a fantastic test match. I really did. I thought England, I think England played beautifully. I think it's important that you get first innings runs in India or in this part of the world. Um, unfortunately, not getting 350 is that's in the end of the day what's cost England in that in that first that first test match. England, I think, only getting 250 is and not staying in the game. I think that's where England will probably say the test match was lost. Some unbelievable performances in there in an individual point of view. I thought England bowled well third, third innings, and I thought they made a valiant effort to have a go at 399. But the, the beauty about it for me is when we were talking about it in the 10 minute interval between third innings and fourth innings, fourth innings we were talking about England going and winning. And everybody, a lot of people believe that England could possibly do that. And I think that's where this game's this where this team has changed Test match cricket, especially playing against England uh, when England are chasing. Uh, so then, when we look at the batting effort on the final day, were there any bits uh, that surprised you? From the outside, it felt like uh, the batters like Ollie Pope and Joe Root, who you would imagine would play the longer hands if this chase was to go England's way. Uh, were they at all guilty of going too hard? I don't think they were guilty of going too hard. I just think their shot execution will be something they'll they'll look back at. You know, Joe doesn't need anybody to tell him about the execution of the shot. He ran down the wicket the over before and hit Axel Patel for four. Um, he wasn't quite the pitch of the ball there. And I thought that might have been a little bit of alarm to then make sure he, the next time he does that, he gets the execution right because he got nowhere near the pitch where he, where he wanted to be. So I, 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 I'm, I would not blame them for the for you know, the mindset of going hard. And the same with Ollie Pope. I would just you know, probably, you'd probably question that whether they were they're in a position for, to execute what they were trying to do, and that would probably say no. Um, England have got this plan to go hard, go positive, and keep going. I think England were looking to win the game in 65 to 75 overs because I think they didn't want the second new ball. And the longer the game went on, the more the pitch deteriorated. And we've seen that the pitch was deteriorating. So I think that was in the mind of England going as hard as it did. So, you know, this is the way the player, this is the mindset they've got. And more often than not, it's, it's worked for them. But I think 399 was just a, a bridge too far. Just a quick word on Joe Root. Uh, four innings into the series, he has 52 runs. Usually the batter who uh, carries England when they visit these parts of the world. Uh, any cause for concern? No cause of concern at all. He's due. So we're 1 1. We're going into three test matches to go. Our best player, the most gifted player that we've ever produced, is due. And he always scores runs in this part of the world. So no question whatsoever. We've got players who are playing well around and helping him out because he's carried this batting unit for far too long now. And in that last 18 months, a lot of people have stood up and recounted. And I'm sure Joe Root, with three test matches to go, will have an impact with the bat in this series. I've got no doubt about that so whatsoever. So I've got no concern. I don't think Ben Stokes will have any concern. And I'm sure Joe Root's got, not got too much concern because he will make sure in the three games that's to come, he put his hand up and he will contribute. Yeah, you talk about a lot of other batters standing up. Uh, no one stood tall more than Zach Crawley, literally and figuratively in this game. Top <laughs> scorer in both the innings and uh, really stood out how he attacked the likes of Bumrah and Ashwin, India's standout bowlers. Uh, how do you look back at Crawley's test match? I thought he batted beautifully. I really did. It's as good as I've seen Zach Crawley's balance and you know, his timing at the crease. I thought his hands were, were excellent. They weren't out in front of themselves too many, in front of his body too many times. I thought he's, again, the, the execution of the ball going back down the pitch and 
his you know the full face of the bat in especially when he was driving through extra cover and down the ground um that's a good sign that Zach Crawley's in a good position so they're great signs for England he's been on a good run since the uh, the ashes um and uh, he, he batted quite well in Hyderabad as well so I don't think Zach will want this break to come I think you want to continue batting but you know from a, a positivity point of view I think that opening partnership that he's forging with Ben Duckett has been very very good on this trip so far and I think that's why England are in a position to to sort of you know be one one in this test series yeah worth highlighting that opening partnership that you bring up uh, that impact right from the top it's something that uh, was singled out by Ben Stokes ahead of the second test and to put things in perspective Crawley and Duckett have had 350 plus stands in the series so far you look at all visiting batters in test cricket in India from 2018 to 2023 and they had, had only four 50 plus partnerships yeah they've been they've been excellent and I think Duckett especially has has really asked questions of India's opening bowlers. I think they've struggled with the lines and the lengths to bowl at Ben Duckett. Um, Mukesh Kumar, he had a, re I mean, he really struggled against um, Ben Duckett. And I think so did Mohammed Siraj in the, uh, in the test matchup with Hyderabad. So the, the only concerning thing about the, 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 the Crowley Duckett partnerships and the stands in this series is they haven't gone on to make a big one. You know, 45 is the lowest. But 59 is the highest. There'd, there'd be a hope that over the course of the, the 10 day break or the 8 day break, they'll be you know, speaking to each other and making sure that when they do get this chance to go again, that they, they, they make sure that they can get a three figure partnership. Because I think that's the difference of this test match England not getting 350 in the first innings. Um, and it's something I think sets the tone. But Duckett and Crawley's positivity at the top, setting the tone and putting India on the back foot. I think is working very, very nicely at this moment in time. Right, let's focus on the bowling now. Uh, they were, as you've already pointed out, uh, key to keeping in England just about in the game in the third innings. Also allowed India not to get away when it felt like they could in the first innings. Uh, where better to begin than Jimmy Anderson? Comes back and delivers another performance to add to his already glowing all-time list. He was brilliant. He was. Him and Bumrah are class apart really are a class apart and it just shows you on on wickets in this part of the world you, as a fast bowler you're gonna have to you have to work so hard from a physical point of view just to put in a, a day's a day's graft really in a, in a test match day of sometimes 10 overs sometimes 12 overs sometimes less um but anderson you know for me in that first innings was was exceptional along with boomer the two of them were a class apart but he had to bowl 35 overs in a test match, 41-year-old. Um, dive around in the field the way he did. I think the skill level he showed was uh, was brilliant. And if anybody was surprised after what happened after the Ashes, you know, Jimmy didn't have the wicket column that he would like in the Ashes. Um, he didn't have to prove anything. He's got 700 test match wickets. So coming over here, he got a good record in India. And I wasn't surprised that. I was surprised he didn't play in Hyderabad. But I wasn't surprised the impact he had. You know, he has great skill sets. Um, and even on wickets, which aren't giving him a great deal, he has the ability to make something happen. And I thought he was excellent this week. He'd probably never bowl with a complementary set of bowlers as raw at the test level. Because at the start of the game, Jimmy Anderson, 183 test caps. England's three frontline spinners, three test caps. And it's worth spending some time on that spin trio, isn't it, Hami? Because... Uh, they come into a game with three tests between them. They see the most seasoned spinner in Joe Root uh, unable to bowl in the second innings. And yet, Hartley, Bashir and Rehan Ahmed finished this test with 15 wickets. Yeah, I thought England's whole bowling unit was was excellent. You know, three test matches between them. Jimmy still thinks he's 18, 19. So he's still the youngest swinger in town, does Jim. So I'd imagine he'd have relished the idea of being on the field, of being at mid-on, being at mid-off, extra cover, talking to the bowlers. So I don't think that will have been bothering Anderson, but I thought the three young lads bowled really well. And I think you've got to put it into context. They have only got three first uh, test matches under their belt. I think they've got 30, uh, less than 30 first-class matches under their belt between them as well. So they're raw, they're naive, they're going to learn. And I think you know, all three of them can be proud of what they've done. Bashir, I thought, was really, really impressive in the first innings. Hartley was very, very impressive in the second innings. Hartley, the all-round package, 
um, is exciting going forward. So I think you know, there will be a massive learning curve for the three of them. Their lines and lengths will need to be sort of, um, would need to be um, made better over the course of their, their sort of next three test matches. But I think the learning curve that they have, um, yeah, I was really impressed by the three young lads. Right. Let's, uh, let's examine the broader uh, perspective of this series. Uh, we head into a bit of a break now, nine days between the second and third tests. England going at one all, which uh, almost no one in the world saw uh, before this series. The way they have challenged India, the way they have pushed India, uh, how and why do you think they've succeeded over the course of two tests, not just a one-off in Hyderabad? Uh, why have they succeeded? I think because India have done what everybody else around the world has done against Ben Stokes and Brendan McCollum's team is go, you can't do it against us. So many teams have come into England. So many teams have said, you, know, you won't do it against us. And I think that's what England have given Rohit Sharma, Rahul Dravid and the India team something to think about. Um, their field positions. Rohit Sharma had a better game as captain, but I still don't think he had the greatest game in the world. Um, I thought he was poor in... Um, Ahmedabad, I thought he's reactive when it comes to the way England went about their business. Um, so I think they got better here and they will get better once they reflect on where they need to be. I think when India come to Riyadh, I think their mindset and their planning department will be a lot different to what it was going into Hyderabad. And I think that's what this England cricket team does to teams. Um, and the teams that quickly work out that we, we can't just go, well, they won't do it on these wickets. They won't do it against Jasper Bumman. They won't do it against our spin bowling attack. Um, England will try. And as we've seen so far, they've succeeded to give India something to think about. So I think that's why England are 1-1 one, one in the series. Do you also get a sense that they've, uh, they've managed to get under India's skin a little? Anderson, with those comments at the end of day three about India's defensive approach, and you clearly saw some heat between Ashwin and Besto when Besto fell. Yeah, look, I think to be fair, our Ashwin can he could have an argument in an empty room, couldn't he? He, he really could. He could argue with himself in the in the mirror. I'm sure he does in the mirror, in the mirror when he gets up and brushes his teeth. He, he doesn't have two arguments before he's finished. Not having a very good day, but what a competitor he, he really is. I really want him to get his yeah his, his 500 Test wicket. Um, in this test match because I think he deserved to. I think he bowled really, really well. Um, but they are getting under, England are getting under um, India's skin. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how they come back in Riyadh because I think they'll have to come back with a different plan. There's no doubt. But when it comes to competitiveness, you know, to see Bairstow and R. Ashwin going at each other, that's great for test cricket. You know, there's a line you don't cross. And I don't think they've got anywhere near that line. You back your own ability, you back your own country, you stand up for your teammates. Um, and if it gets into a discussion and a heated discussion, so be it. That's fine. There's no problem with that. Um, as long as it doesn't overstep the mark. I don't think any of them overstep the mark. So I just think that England of getting under India's skin and um, we'll watch the space and see how that develops and where it goes. But, you know, our Ashwin, he's a feisty soul and I'm sure... He can't wait for the rest of the series to start again. Yeah, and what's an India-England series without some amount of needles? So what if the coaches are Brendan McCullum and Rahul Dravid? It's a long gap between uh, Vizag and Rajkot. Long enough for Steve Harmison, who's been in India for the first two tests, to make the trip back home and he'll cover the rest of the series from there. Uh, we hope you've had a good time in uh, India, Steve, and uh, look forward to your company through the rest of the series. Yeah, I can't wait. I really, I'm not looking forward to going back to minus four, minus five and getting up at one o'clock in the morning at pitch dark in London to bring the rest of the series. But I tell you what, I can't wait. These 10 days are going to take forever because this series, not only is it live, um, hey, it could be heads or tails of where it goes. And I mean heads or tails because the toss could be crucial in the next three venues. If England can win the toss two out of three times, the dream could be on. England might just spring a surprise and nick this series yep anything could happen we leave it there the series is alive and kicking test cricket is alive and kicking uh, that's all from us on espn cricket for match day